In this lecture, we're going to talk about our last application of radiochemistry, um, which is fission and fusion. <clears throat> so uh, the process of fission and fusion release is just an enormous amount of energy. Um, that's why we try to harness these uh, for our own energy purposes. So fission is when a really large nucleus is so unstable that when it's hit by a neutron, it actually splits into two smaller nuclei rather than just emitting particles as it decays. And that split produces a lot of energy and also some more neutron particles. Now, fusion on the other hand is when you have two small nuclei that um, smash into each other and form a larger nucleus. Now, the electrostatic repulsion of bringing two positive charged particles together like that uh, would prevent it from happening. But if you accelerate the particles fast enough, they'll overcome that repulsion of their charges and they'll actually combine and form a larger nucleus. And it'll also release a lot of energy as you bring those, think about the strong force of bringing nuclei together or nucleons together into a nucleus, uh, will have a, a big release of energy as well. So we're going to focus on fission because that's something that we, we utilize in our daily lives rather than fusion. Um, and so here is an example of the fusion of nuclear reactors, right? So looking at uranium-235, uh, it's a radioactive isotope, but when it's, it's huge. And so when it's hit by a neutron, it becomes extremely unstable as 236 uranium, and it splits apart into krypton-92 and barium-141, and then lots of energy and also some neutrons are also released in that process. Um, other ones that'll do this that are, are fissionable are going to be other large ones like uh, plutonium-239 or plutonium-240. Uh, and so what we can do to harness this is we, we see that a chain reaction occurs. It, it takes a neutron to um, make the uranium split and it releases more neutrons when that happens. And so if it isn't a sample of uranium-235, those neutrons are gonna go and hit other uranium nuclei and they will themselves split. And we have this chain reaction um, from one neutron and a nucleus to forming all of these other uh, fusion events that will take place in the side, the sample. Um, and so in this case, our neutrons are, are like a catalyst, they're, they're a reactant, like they make this happen, but then they're also produced through the process of fission as well. And so thinking about this chain reaction, the uh, minimum amount of fissionable isotope that you need to sustain this chain reaction is what we're gonna call the critical mass um, for the reaction, for the fission reaction. Um, so now let's look at how nuclear power plants work. Um, so a nuclear reactor is using fusion to generate energy, and it's doing it by boiling water. So it's a really fancy way of boiling water, but it's pr the, the reaction itself produces a lot of energy that heats up water, which the steam then turns a steam turbine, and that generates electricity. That water then can be condensed um, over uh, pumped cold water coils and then recycled into the reactor again and to be converted, heated up into steam to turn the turbine and it can go around. And so that water is recycled through that process. Um, but all that energy, all that heat is generated from the fission process taking place inside the reactor core. And so on this, we can see we've got our reactor right here. Um, and we'll talk about this in the next page. And it's heating up this water tank right here. So the energy, uh, it's pumping water through these coils to heat up this water here, which turns into steam and turns this steam turbine. And then we cool it down and cycle through this. Um, and this right here is like a containment shell for the whole process. So let's look at that, that um, reactor a little bit more. And so what's happening with one of these reactors, we have a three main components to keep track of. Um, so we have our control rods right here. Um, and these are gonna be full of a neutron absorbing material. So that's usually gonna be boron or cadmium um, there to kind of absorb some of those excess neutrons that are given off through the fission process. 
We then have our fuel cells, um, our fuel rods. These are made out of uranium in this case. Um, and so we have our, our uranium fuel cylinders or rods sitting down in the um, actual reactor and the control rods can come up and down. And that's gonna control the amount of neutrons that are actually absorbed by the fission process. Um, and so then the, the rods are also placed in a material, so a coolant or uh, that is within the whole thing um, right here. It's coming incoming cool and hot coolant going out to heat things. Um, that's a moderator. And what it's trying to do is just slow down the ejected neutrons. Um, and it's a way to kind of slow the fission process so it's still generating all this heat, but it brings it down below the critical mass of the chain reaction. Um, and so the moderator and the control rods are helping to control this chain reaction of fission that's occurring in the uranium fuel cylinders or rods. So thinking about nuclear power, um, there are pros and cons to it. Um, I'm not sure there's really a clear answer here. Um, there's some really amazing things about nuclear power. It is uh, just 50 kilograms of a fuel of uranium can generate enough energy for a million people. Um, and so this is extremely small compared to the millions of kilograms of coal that you need to do the same thing. Um, and there's also, there's no air pollution. There's like the, the NO2 and the, the sulfoxide or the sulfides, sulfoxides and carbon dioxide produced by coal plants are, are cause our greenhouse gases that cause acid rain and their global warming. And, and so that's really attractive about nuclear power. It's a small amount of fuel. It is like, our, it isn't changing the climate in terms of like greenhouse gas emissions. But on the downside, if the core melts down, um, it's a huge health and environmental catastrophe. And so the, some of the famous ones are Chernobyl in 1986. Um, and then Fukushima most recently in 2011. And that, when that, that, that fission process gets out of control and that radioactive material uh, gets outside of its containment, it has uh, a huge impact on, on human life. Um, and then the other problem with it is that nuclear waste is uh, really radioactive. It's, it's, remember we went through that long decay series for uranium. Well, it's gonna do that for a really long time after those fuel rods are, are finished. And so we need to do something with this extremely radioactive material. It has to be transported through places people live in, and it has to be stored somewhere. Right now, we have a high-level radioactive waste storage facility at Yucca Mountain in Nevada, and it is way over capacity. Um, and it was, it, it's not a sustainable solution. And this is uh, radioactive waste that will harm human life for, for just an extremely long time, well beyond our perception of time as like the United States existing. And so how do you store it in a way that future organisms, humans, aren't hurt by it later when our, you know, society is crumbled? So the waste is a huge problem within nuclear power. Um, and, and, and then we also have to deal with the infrastructure too. When a nuclear power plant's no longer safe to operate, it is still a nuclear power plant that has a contamination problem and that exists and that site can't be used for anything else. And so the perfect example of this is Hanford here in Washington state. Um, and, and revitalizing that area is a long decades and decades long project um, that costs a lot of money. And so, so nuclear power is very attractive, but it also has really high risks um, compared to other energy sources. 